Hello and welcome to the Moonshots Podcast. It's episode 257. I'm your co-host, Mike Parsons, and as always, I'm joined by the man himself, Mr. Mark Pearson Freeland. Good morning, Mark. Good morning, Mike. Good morning, listeners, subscribers, viewers, and anybody else who's dialing in, looking to try and get either a bit of inspiration, a little bit of lessons, or maybe, Mike, a little bit of moment of creative muscle growth. Boy, do we have a brand new series as well as a brand new show kicking off on the Moonshots series today. Yes, Mark, I would say it is protein packed. <laughs> That's right, Mike. That's right. And who's delivering the protein? Well, it's none other, none other than New York Times bestseller, Austin Cleon. Now, Mike, Austin Cleon is an individual that we've probably referenced on the show before. Some people, such as uh, our listeners, will probably be familiar, perhaps, with his work that we're going to lean in towards on our Austin Cleon series, kicking off today with Steel Like an Artist. But Cleon's done a really interesting job over his, over his uh, short years, short tenure years of being you know, a, a best-selling artist in the fact that he's done a lot of it from scratch. You know, he created a lot of work, but also he's helped us understand how he went out and did it. And I think as we lean into this brand new series that we're going to kick off today, it's going to be filled with a lot of inspiration, a lot of tips and a lot of tricks, as well as, I think, a lot of fun, because some of the work that Austin Kluhn's created is pretty, pretty inspiring, isn't it? It certainly is, because what he basically does is he takes where we got to in the Seth Godin series, where we were presented with, hey, your products need a big idea, a big story around it. It needs to be very creative. So you and I put on our thinking caps and said, well, okay, what would be the perfect series to get into mm. after going deep on Seth Godin? And Austin Kleon is the one. So if you know you want to build a product, a service, a community, a project, and you're looking to tell a creative story, you're looking to unleash your creativity in the world, and you might be thinking... Oh, this has been done before. My ideas are crap. Here's the thing. Taking some inspiration from not only Seth Godin, but also Elizabeth Gilbert. You can do this because we've got a bunch of ideas from Austin on how you can create ideas. And it doesn't, and this is the important one, Mark, it doesn't matter if it's been done before. We've certainly not done a show like this before. Where do you want to begin? Oh, I want to begin from hearing from the legend himself, Austin Cleon. So Austin's done a lot of great talks. And this first one, Mike, that I thought we could kick off our show with today is a talk that he did with Google. He's going to break down a key insight from his book, Steal Like an Artist, today. And I think, Mike, this one's going to stand out for all of us because nothing comes from nowhere. What a good artist understands is that nothing comes from nowhere. All creative work builds on what came before. Nothing is completely original. This itself is actually not a new idea. It's right there in the Bible. Uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 9. Uh, that which has been is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Now, some people find this idea completely depressing. Um, but for me, it's always filled me with hope. Um, as the French writer André Gide put it, Everything that needs to be said has already been said, but since no one was listening the first time, everything must be said again. See, I think if we're free of the burden of trying to be completely original, we can stop trying to make something out of nothing, and we can embrace influence instead of running away from it. So you have this idea that every new idea is just a remix or a mashup of one or more previous ideas. And this is a little trick they teach you in art school. You can play along if you want to. Um, you draw a line on a piece of paper, and then you draw another line parallel to it. Well, how many lines are there on the paper? At first, you think there's two. There's the first line you drew, and there's the second line you drew. But then if you look in between them, there's a line of negative space running in between them. One plus one sometimes equals three. And here's an example of what I'm talking about. Genetics. You have a mother and you have a father. You possess features from both of them, but the sum of you are 
you're a remix of your mom and dad and all of your ancestors. Everything is remixed, Mark. Like, this is really interesting because mm. nobody as a human doesn't occur. This unique thing, this unique Mark, this unique Mike, all had two people needed to tango in order for us to resolve. Yeah. But here's yeah. the interesting thing. When you look at great artists, I've got a list here. Like, just check this out. Pablo Picasso, he was influenced by African art, Iberian sculpture, and the artist Paul Cezanne. So he was getting inspired by others. Van Gogh, mm. Jean-Francois Millet, Japanese woodblock were his inspirations. Um, William Shakespeare took historical accounts and classic texts. The, the Beatles were inspired by Indian music and Motown. So you kind of yeah. realize that everything comes from combinations, even ourselves, mm great art, great artists. So here's the great thing. Then as when we put on our little creator hat, Mark, hmm. then we know that we can take a little bit of this and a little bit of that and put them together and we get something new. Hmm. It's like human, like family trees. That's how it works. It's how the artists yeah. work. It's how business works works like think about it right now all the innovation in the technology and business area is taking traditional businesses and saying now with ai <laughs> like, mm, like it's combination yeah. right so i mm -hmm. think when you truly accept the notion that nothing is original like you cannot say that picasso was the first because he was inspired mm -hmm. by some guys and some women, and then they were inspired by some other people, and then those people were inspired by other people. So it's this big loop yeah. of creativity of remixing, and uh, you know, we get really to the source of things with this book, which is still like an artist, and we're going to explain how to do that. Yeah. But the reality is, we first need to accept this is like first principles thinking: yeah. is everything is a remix, nothing is original, even the greatest artists apply to this. Even our own genetic family trees, they use this model. I think the reason I'm calling this out, we've got to really accept this because once you do, then you can say, well, it's natural, one plus one equals three. But if you deny this, you're kind of stuck, right? I, I totally agree. And you're right. Hearing the list of individuals that inspired a lot of those folks, whether they be musicians, artists, or business leaders, or even companies. When I was pulling, when we were pulling together this show, Mike, for today, I found it very reassuring. So, and you've already called out Elizabeth, Elizabeth Gilbert with Big Magic. There was a real sense of reassurance and um, energy that comes from studying her book, Big Magic, because she calls out the fact that nothing is original, but it's better said, it's original because you haven't done it before. Right. So if I was to pick up a pen today, or you and I, as we're exploring Austin Cleon's work, he's already said it, but what we're doing and creating is something original because we are interpreting it for the first time. Yes. Everything is unique because it hasn't been done before. Whether that's you recreating a portrait by Picasso, it won't be a Picasso portrait. It'll be a Picasso portrait by Mike Parsons, exactly. which will be the first time you've ever done it. Yes. So no matter what it is, whether you're tracing an idea or whether you're getting inspired by something that's unique and then that informs the product or the idea that you're creating. For me, Mike, like you say, it is that first principles. It is that moment of embracing where the influence comes from. And I love this idea of community. You know, the well, fact that you're seeing this inspiration, whether it's in architecture, artists, whoever it might be, it all is a product of what came before. Which yes. I which I think is great, right? <laughs> well, it's liberating, and I, I want to stay here for a moment. I got another list for you. Okay, <laughs> Facebook was inspired by MySpace and Friendster. Mm. Apple, for example, Apple put the graphic user interface into computers instead of using like DOS prompts and terminal. Mm. Well, that actually came from Zero Park. Do we do we for a moment say Google hasn't been wildly successful because Alta Vista existed before or mm. Yahoo? No, yeah. we accept yeah. them as great things. So the awesome mm -hmm. thing is it doesn't matter if it's been done before and it doesn't matter who did it or what. You haven't done it and everything mm -hmm. 
everything is building on prior art, prior history. Yeah. So this, to me, opens it all up for creativity and blue skies, right? Yeah. I'm, if anything, Mike, I think that this book, this insight is very, very moonshotty because what we're doing and what we're calling out is you are learning from what's come before. Yeah. Artists are learning from previous inspirations. Same with music. You're sampling a particular beat. That's because you kind of like it. You kind of dig it. And you've learned it from somebody who's created it. To then that inject that into your product or for you and I and our listeners, we're injecting some of these tips into our lives in order to become that little bit better. Yeah. All we're doing there is boring and being inspired by what's being created. Yes. What a perfect kind of moonshot message, isn't it? Keep on being lifelong learners. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, it really is. And, I mean, just to bring it home, I mean, we would never for one step discount the creativity and the the amazing ingenuity of rap and hip-hop artists. Mm. Their whole genre is built on sampling i.e. taking historical samples from like Motown and other cool things and repurposing and reinventing. And we would never for a moment think that that's not creative. Well, the great news is you can use it yourself. Remix, create, build Mm. upon prior art and build something new because it's everywhere. This pattern is everywhere. It's almost like how much you can get out of the idea of being a member of Moonshots, even though Mm. there are plenty of members already. Yeah, you're totally right. Not only do we find, Mike, that there's a plethora of individuals who are supporting and being part of the Moonshots family, but they grow each and every week. And I think you're right. That is because they're getting inspired by one another. They're getting inspired by the Moonshots show. Mark, 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 I have to tell you, sorry, I've got to interrupt. That's not it. The reason that people become members is that they love the official Mark Pearson Freeland trumpets. This is why oh, everyone's tuning right. in. Come on. Well, let me just, the good news for you, Mike, is I've been tuning it all week long and yeah. it is yeah. ready to make a big celebration <laughs> for all of our individuals who support the Moonshot Show, including Bob, Ken, Dietmar, Marjan, Connor, Rodrigo, Lisa, and Sid, Mr. Bonjour, Paul, Berg, and Kalman, Joe, Christian, Samuela, and Barbara. Chris, Deborah, Lasse, and Steve, Craig, Ravi, Eva, Nikuara, Ingram, Dirk, Venkata, Marco, Jet, and Roger. Steph, Raw, Nimelen, Diana, Christoph, Denise, Laura, and Smitty round out all of our individual members who have joined us for over 12 months, many of whom are even longer than that. So, guys, thank you so much for your continued support. We're glad you're getting your lunar powered dose of good karma each week, along with Corey. Daniela, Mike and Dan, Antonio, Zachary, Austin and Fred, Jez, Ola, Andy, Diana, Margie, Chris and Ron. All of you guys are rock stars as well. Thank you for being part of the Moonshots family. We are eternally grateful and we appreciate all of your help for us to still like artists to take, hang on, we take clips from people talking about these ideas. We're doing it ourselves. Austin, Cleon would be proud. And he would also be proud of some of the deduction that we do. But I think in his mind and in the kind of storyline of his book, it's really about this idea of subtraction, isn't it, Matt? That's right. So let's hear now from Clark Hegley, who's going to break down one of the key concepts from Austin Cleon's book, Still Like an Artist, in a way that is super, super simple. And it calls out this concept of creativity being all about subtraction. Dr. Seuss wrote The Cat in the Hat with only 236 words. The best part about this story is that his editor dared him. He said, whoa, Dr. Seuss, you wrote 236 words. This book sound like crazy. Well, I bet you can't write a book in 50 words. And he turned around, said I can, and wrote The Cat in the Hat. Or was it Green Eggs and Ham? I don't know which one, but phenomenal. So if he can write a best-selling book one of the best-selling books, children's books of all time, with just 50 words, imagine what we can do. Like, what's our excuse? We have to have the best words. We have to have the best punctuation. We have to phrase it right, stories. A lot gets lost in the details. And when you strip all that down, focus on the core element that makes it work, 50 words, we're able to create something. Another example, Apple. They were obsessed. Steve Jobs was obsessed with design. He wanted the iPhone to have only one button on it. They said, Steve, we can't do that. We need a lock screen. We need a off. We need volume. We need up and down. And he was, he was livid. He wanted it to just have one button on and off. 
took them extra years, but they finally did it with the lock screen, right? Or with the single button right there. They're obsessed with minimal design. They want everything to be streamlined and simple. I got some great advice from a public speaking teacher. He said, Clark, never give someone more than three points. Any more than three, they're not gonna remember it. And so if someone comes up there and they're speaking, they say, all right, today I got 15 points for you on how to change limiting beliefs. You're gonna be like, oh my God, I can't do that. But if someone gets up there and says, I have three points for limiting beliefs, like, all right, I can follow three. So in other words, when you simplify the message, it's even more effective. When you go from 236 words in a kid's book to 50, when you go from, you know, an old phone that had dial pads on there to one button on an iPhone, it's more streamlined. People understand this. They like the minimalism. Um, so however it is in your life, simplify it. Figure out what the core is. The last thing I'll say on this point is that, you know, with creation, a lot of it is by what we take away and not by what we add. Uh, why is it that simplicity is so hard? Because mm. I think when you reduce things down, you get to the core. And it makes me think about this show. We take an entire book and put it into four clips. Yeah. So that very process, we're asking ourselves, and all the work we do before we make this show together, like right now, is about what should be in, how does it, how does it sound, is it complete, what can we remove? And for me, this can this this constraint of making things so simple is actually very powerful for creativity. It's almost like if someone said, hey, guys, you can do 50 clips for five hours. I feel really, really sorry for our listeners and viewers and members. That would be pretty <laughs> painful stuff. But isn't it interesting how, well, we wouldn't need so much discretion, Mark, because we could literally mm. just find every Austin Cleon clip and throw it in and ramble on for five hours. But funnily yeah. enough, it's actually harder to do an hour show with four clips because we have to think what's going to have the greatest impact? How do we organize this? And much like when you're presenting to a client, when you're making uh, product packaging, you have limited time and space. You have yeah. to get to the essence of things. And that art of simplifying is something that takes time, but I believe that's where the great creativity comes from. And I will go back to what we saw with Picasso. He made, he deconstructed and simplified many shapes such as the bull. Mm -hmm. And the way and the work that he put into that simplification should never be underestimated. That's why his work is so great. He was able to deconstruct and simplify. If you think about how simple the rhythms and melodies are of the Beatles, but they're amazing and catch, and they're still with us, right? Yeah, yeah. The Big point time. here is that art of reduction is a key to creativity because actually we're being a bit lazy when we over- communicate, when we make mm. 50 clips, when we make the product packaging so big so we can put every message on it, yeah. when we take two hours to explain a very simple proposition in a meeting, mm. that is the absence of creativity. The real creativity mm. comes from the reduction. I like that. And that's a great um, accumulation, Mike, that, that idea, creativity being the reduction. Because if you think about the benefits of having constraints in work, you know, whether that's time, whether it's availability to present to somebody else, or whether it's just your own availability of time, a lot of that informs a more creative approach to the way that you deliver the work. Mm. Sometimes you're going to have to delegate. Sometimes you'll find yourself procrastinating and then you'll have to catch up. Yeah. But what you'll find is giving yourself, giving yourself kind of um, borders and timeframes and ways that you really need to focus the work, it then becomes better. Because you're right, if we were to create a show with 50 clips, it would be- um, Awful. <laughs> un 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 incomprehensible. It would be too yeah. large. Yeah. You know, we're looking for those short and sharp key insights that will inform you and I and all of our listeners to learn something 
from each of these these topics and books. Yeah. So in order to distill really fur down into you know that the juicy morsels is really really key. But it's freeing because once we know, okay, we've got four clips, we want to hit the key things that stand out for us. Let's get into it. That for me is reassuring. Mm -hmm. When I'm going into a big presentation with a client, or when I'm thinking I need to create something for my team, where do I start? Sometimes by having those constraints figured out in terms of timeline, in terms of delivery date, in terms of available resources, that then helps how you approach it. So I see this concept of subtraction or, or simplification or the idea of constraint being so important to going out to create anything because it helps you stay in the lanes and helps you actually deliver the work on time and also in a in a fashion that is digestible. Yeah, totally. How mm. how when you're faced with the need to simplify, mm. let's say let's take something that I think all of us face like communication, how do you go about trying mm. to cut it down like wh what's your starting point? Yeah, big time. I th I think communication is the key. Uh, topic really that actually mm. simplification is, is so key for because well one you're trying to get across a, a, a simple or complicated idea in a simple and concise way so, so sometimes so how do you do it how do you do it then like how do you do I'll, it? I'll, so i'll start by writing it down yeah so typically whether that's more nowadays i'll write it i'll type it out yeah and then i'll go back through and maybe i'll highlight in bold or highlight you know physically in you know yellow the key topics or the key areas that I really want to try and land. Yeah. Let's say I'm pitching to another uh, another business yeah. or, or somebody else. I'll come up with a script. I'll come up with those key points and I'll figure out what those key talking areas are. I'll then make sure to uh, trim out all of the fat. You know, I'm English, so sometimes I'm a little bit verbose. <laughs> so I'll try and trim out any of that additional chat that is yeah. not necessarily needed yeah. and instead focus on having those pillars really, really tight really, really concrete and make sure that you hit them in a fashion that makes sense. Yeah. Because much like we were hearing from Clark, much like you and I have just broken down, if we have a whole meaty meal or a whole meaty conversation that you're trying to process, I think the individual who's hearing it only absorbs 20%. I, I can't remember that figure that we've once covered, I think, on the show. But if you hear, let's say it's an hour-long meeting, you're only going to absorb a certain amount before your brain sort of turns off. So really getting those key points early in the conversation, early in that meeting, I think is intrinsically key as well. Mm. What about you, Mike? When you're thinking about the idea of uh, simplification or getting across an idea in quite a concise way, I know that you do it a lot and you've done it a lot in the past, condensing those complicated ideas into simple ways. What's the best method that you find is, is helpful? Oh, I've got some go-tos for you here on this one. Number one, write the headline or write the subject of the email first. Mm -hmm. That That's really good. Like try and write the email in the headline, in, in the subject mm -hmm. line. The next one is um, when writing email, lead with the action that you're requesting and then explain it after. So yeah. something you've heard me say a lot is don't bury the lead concept, right? So it can be tempting to like go, I want to tell you a story of, I'm going to ask you to do something, but first let me tell you the entire story. I think it's always good to be like, hey, can you send me a document tomorrow before end of play? Here's what I need. Here's why I need it. Yeah. Reach out to me if you need anything. So leading with the action required. Um, and write the, the headline, write the subject line, whatever is appropriate first. Um, you know, I love this idea that I um, was um, taught in my time as a madman on Madison Avenue. And this was with elevated pitches and high concepts. Mm -hmm. So um, something, I can't remember if we've mentioned this on the show, but when Ridley Scott, was pitching Alien to the studio. He just walked in, ready, and he just goes, I want you to imagine Jaws, Jaws on a spaceship. And the executives yeah. were like, <laughs> what? That is crazy. I mean, talk <laughs> about creativity, right? Mm. That's a great example. I isn't like that. that. Isn't that so powerful, right? And imagine mm. if every one of our email subject lines were like that. 
<laughs> so I think the key, if I was receiving that pitch from Ridley Scott, maybe one day, who knows, or I was receiving that email from yourself or, or a colleague, suddenly as a receiver, so now if we're putting ourselves into the other individual shoes, I know exactly what's expected of me. There's no lack of uh, consideration. There's no miscommunication. When you simplify everything, and obviously we're leaning more towards the delivery of, of tasks or the request of information, it makes it so much clearer for people who are receiving it, doesn't it? I would be relieved to get that email and know, okay, right, Mike's looking for jaws in space. He wants me to go X, Y, and Z. Cool, I'll go and get started. It makes it a lot easier for those around you as well as for you and I as the creators because we know exactly what we're looking for in our own heads, don't we? Yes, and let's not forget there was a lot of work done to get to jaws in a spaceship. So yes. it, it wasn't just like coming up with something random. There was a, <laughs> there was a lot of work uh, there. Yeah. And um I think that art of simplification is truly, really powerful. I would also say that if you go to moonshots.io, you'll find us decoding the universe to make it simple for you to get the most out of these superstars, these authors, academics, experts, figuring out how they do it. Eric Ries, Lean Startup, Tim Ferriss, mm. Growth Mindset, you name it, all of those subjects, you will find beautiful little summaries beautiful lessons learned how to apply it in each of the shows just go to moonshots.io i mean what's our belief mark that if you spend enough time listening to the show it's um what do you become empowered with there's something lunar powered uh, what happens oh i mean for conveniently mike you and i are recording i think it's a full moon today it is so not only will our our members be receiving the moonshots lunar powered dose of good karma but they'll also be receiving the moon's karma as well. So, Jeez. I mean, right now, Mike, is a time to be creative, clearly. <laughs> Jeez, I'm, I'm just, uh, when I hear that, I just want to sink into creativity and let loose on this full moon. <laughs> I want to bring out my inner yeah. werewolf. Where are we going next on this journey? <laughs> well, an inner werewolf individual that's going to come out howling for us today on Austin Kleon Steel Like an Artist is Maxwell Nichols. So Maxwell is going to, break down a little bit about this idea of focus. We now know the concept of simplifying an idea, maybe creativity being uh, an act of subtraction. Let's now think about how we find those ideas and how we can get a little bit more focus by sinking into depth. You might be thinking now that it's gonna be so much easier to create when you can just unapologetically steal from everybody. You're wrong. In this new context, you don't have to worry so much about being so original, but you need to relentlessly consume and research. Our new measurement for good work is the depth and quality of our sources. Obviously, execution is the ultimate measurement of good work, but here in the ideation stage, be concerned with the quality of your curation. A significant challenge is what to ignore. We're smothered with content every waking second, which I actually think it's kind of great, but you must choose what to forget or ignore and hold on to the things that genuinely resonate with you. An easy way in reducing the overwhelming quantity of work is to sink into depth, focusing on the nuance of a single artist or subject. Attention to depth happens to be more lucrative as well. You'll reach an executable level of understanding much quicker than if you splayed your concentration across multiple disciplines and artists. There's a rule called the three book rule that simply states by reading three books at any specific subject, you'll become an expert relative to the general population. In this day and age, I feel like there's some topics that you'd only need to read one book about. Imagine how proficient you can become in any niche by dedicating a substantial amount of time to that specific topic. By focusing on the depth of a matter and eliminating the limitless assortment of materials you could study, you'll find ideas and themes worth working on. You'll begin to recognize what ideas inspired your favorite artist, what ideas pushed them to follow the same path as their influences. Ooh, I mean, it's like he's talking about what we do here, focusing on books. Mm. We have three books in this very series, Mark. I mean, holy <laughs> smoke. Hopefully we get uh, uh, a little bit of good karma from that. But yeah. um, to me, he started with this interesting idea. This is not just going out into the world and mm. ripping off what already exists, right? Right. No. No. I think this is important. So I'm going to share with you and all of our viewers uh, something from Austin that 
total it's like a checklist which is totally moonshotty and it talks about good versus bad theft okay so what's good theft where you honor the works that came before rather than degrading mm. where you study the work before rather than just skimming where you steal mm. from many rather than stealing from one where you give credit rather than plagiarizing where you transform rather than just imitating whether you just remix rather than ripping mm. off. This Ooh. is exactly what we're talking about in this clip. And I would say I want to do a fun job. I want to sell this idea to our viewers, our listeners, and our members, right? The reason why you don't want to take one thing and just degrade it, skim it, steal from it, plagiarize, imitate, and rip it all off, right, is invariably – the person that made that has done all the good things, spent a lot of time and effort. So anything you do without the same level of effort off the back of that is going to be substandard to the original source. Mm -hmm. However, if you study, as per the clip, three pieces of work in this given area, and then you can see some interesting things. What are the patterns? Because when we study Elizabeth Gilbert and Austin Cleon, we see this clear similarity where they want to give us permission because we're all unique, therefore we can all have unique ideas. This must be, I mean, this is literally the science of what we do on the show. We're like, okay, this mm. is a clue. We're like Sherlock Holmes. Because we're studying a subject, creativity in this case, and we're actually starting to see that great people from different walks of life have come to, through their work, the same aha. And what we do is we summarize it and give it to our audience and say, well, look, mm. this is a moonshots pattern. We see this time and time again. So if you were studying three different companies, you could build a great company of your own. If you studied three musicians, you could make a great song of your own mm. because you see the pattern. And what yeah. you do is when you see patterns, you relate to them. You're like, oh, this really works for me. How might I use this? Right. There are many other patterns in when comparing Elizabeth Gilbert and Austin Cleon. But one of the ones that really jumps out to us, the one of the really strong ones, is this idea of permission and uniqueness. Right. So yes. this is where we've gravitated towards. We wouldn't have known, Mark, that this was so strong if we had only studied Elizabeth or only studied right. Austin. So our conviction is far higher. We can use it much more. Mark, viewers, listeners, and members, this, to, this is my pitch to you on why you should always go out and look at what's come before and really steal from many would be the key, key, key thing. Yeah, and I totally agree, Mike. The only build I can do there is I'm reminded when I was studying when I was younger, when I was reading uh, a lot of uh, you know, ancient books on history and so on. When I was writing a dissertation, I'm also reminded of medical papers that you know those around me have studied or taken part in. All of those uh, um, records include references and source material. You know, throughout history, it's always based on the account of somebody else, and that idea of taking from many or being inspired from many, or as Austin's saying, stealing from many, is based on a broad range of experiences. And what's nice when we're able to take a look at those quality of sources and be able to create and um, focus on depth, immersion, and so on, is that we can then go out and prove the value that is in the work that we go out and create. You know, we're able to really go out and celebrate, aren't we, based on the insights that we can find from others. And this, to me, this studying of a couple of you know, three, four works in any given area, be it creativity, entrepreneurial, sports, fitness, health, whatever. To me, where we start to intersect, which is really fun, is with this idea of deep work. Mm. So uh, in that clip we heard about this idea of sink into it, right, which is so adjacent to this idea of deep work. Yeah. Lock it off three hours and go deep an hour per book boom 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 you've got the pattern yeah. how much do we love 
the idea of deep work, Mike. You know, we've focused on, you know, Cal Newport. Once again, he's coming up here. This idea of digital minimalism and deep work, I think, is part and parcel with Elizabeth as well as Austin as well. You know, they might he might be more in the vein of actually uh, production, you know, time block yourself. Uh, likewise with Mihai Csikszentmihalyi, getting yourself into flow. Mm. Those are both physical techniques to really become a creator. You but can't, I think you can't that, achieve flow state according to Mihai unless you do the focus and the deep work, right? Exactly. That's it. That's exactly where I was going to take it. Yeah, and isn't it interesting, once again, we're finding that permission. You know, if we're inspired by Mihai or we love the work of Cal, the the insights that we've learned from Austin and the builds that we've now uh, accumulated on Elizabeth Gilbert help us really appreciate, okay, well, the less is more concept is so valuable because then people will understand my idea. The focus really gives me the ability to become an expert. You know, that's uh, really a, a habit, I think, that we've learned on the Moonshot Show, immersing yourself, becoming as much of an expert as you can in that time. You know, you and I like to dig into key insights throughout the Moonshot Show, but there's also a plethora of external elements and pieces of information and and inspirations that drive a lot of these topics and books that we dig into. As we're hearing from Austin on today's show, he was inspired by many others who became before him. I'd say the same with Brené Brown, with Oprah, Walt Disney, and so on. A lot of them have become, and also Dyson, even Steve Jobs, were inspired by those who came before them, yeah. as are you and I with yes. the Moonshot Show. Yeah. But being able to really get into that depth is so, so key, isn't it? It, it, it really is. And, and I hope that what we're seeing here is not only the inspiration and the permission, but we're starting to see a little bit here, make it simple, get focused, mm. remix, go deep. This is starting to unlock a creative work style, a creative work habit, a way mm. for you to unleash. What's also interesting just to prepare all of our members, listeners, and viewers is that in the next book from Austin, he gets into like networking and how to take your work out into the world, something that can be a little bit intimidating. But then in his third book, he talks about this loop and the resilience you need to keep working on it. Like the happiness series, we learned this as a muscle. So that's all ahead in future shows. But Mark, where do we want to pivot to now? I think you've got a cheeky fourth clip up your sleeve. I, I do. And the reason why I think you find this a bit cheeky is because it is a great demonstration of some of the lessons that we've already learned today. So obviously, as you've just broken down, this will be our first episode in the Austin Cleon series. And there's a great journey that Austin does through the books that he's created. What's interesting about this final clip that we're going to have today on Steel Like an Artist is a demonstration, in my mind, of the idea of creativity being an exercise in subtraction as well as an exercise in focus and depth. So let's hear one more time today from Austin Cleon, author of Steal Like an Artist, who's going to help us understand the difference between an artist and hoarders, as well as something called newspaper blackouts. I think that human beings are collectors, and artists especially. Not hoarders, mind you, there's a difference. <laughs> Hoarders collect indiscriminately, and the artists collect selectively. They only collect the things that they really love. An artist's job is to collect ideas, and the best way I know to collect ideas is to read. And what better thing to read than the daily dispatch of human experience that is the daily newspaper? So in 2005, I was right out of college, right out of undergrad, and I had a horrible case of writer's block. I would sit and I would stare at the Microsoft Word screen and that little cursor would blink at me as if it were taunting me. Um, and writing, which had once given me great joy, was now, it, was, it wasn't any fun for me anymore. So one day, I was staring at that screen and I looked over at the recycle bin with that stack full of papers and I thought, here am I, here I am, <laughs> without any words. And right next to me are thousands of them and they're delivered to my doorstep every day. So I thought I might steal a few, and this is what I did. I picked up my marker that I used for drawing, and I started making boxes around words that popped out at me. 
And I started connecting those words into little phrases and, and funny sayings. And when I was done, I blacked out all the words I didn't need. And this is what it looks like. It looks like as if the CIA did haiku. Um, <laughs> And I, I really wasn't sure what I was doing. I, all I knew was that it felt really good to watch some of those words disappear under that marker line. Um, and so what I did was I, uh, I started posting them to my blog, and I called them newspaper blackout poems. And slowly over time, uh, they spread around the internet, and I collected them in my first book, Newspaper Blackout. Mark, how cool is that? He was so stuck. I mean, the classic writer's block, everyone has experienced this. Like, oh, I have nothing, nothing's coming to mind. So he just looked next to him and looked at the newspaper and started blacking out a few words. And this has launched him into a New York Times bestseller. This to me is one massive invitation to be curious about the world right? Mm -hmm. To put yeah. yourself in a place, in a moment that you do look across at that newspaper and say, how might I? What if? Right? Great creative prompts. And play with this idea of remixing old things with new and just experimenting. And if you actually have that curious mindset that you want to go out and collect and remix, then what I believe is happening is you are charging your mind and you're, you've got like this energized database of possibilities and you just shake your brain and then sometime, at some moment in some place, it will pop out and you will quite can quite literally see this source moment this original origin moment for his entire career came down to he was stuck and he's like, oh, well, why don't I just black out a few words? And then away we yeah. go. And isn't that a great founder story, mm -hmm. so to speak? Mm. You know, and again, I believe this insight and this behavior of his, this newspaper blackout approach came from the pure insight of less is more. There's a great relief in being an author and a writer and him being able to create from work that already exists. Literally, he's picking up newspaper and blacking out some words. For me, I think that's a pure demonstration in creativity. He's creating from something that already exists, much like a, a marble a sculptor from back in you know the old Roman times. They find a big uh, stone and they chisel it away and then they're left with this stunning um, you know, item that you find in a mausoleum. But this is a more modern day approach. You're taking a plethora of words and you're distilling them down into something that you want to communicate to your readers. I personally think that this is a good exercise that I'm probably going to start doing, Mike, to be honest. I think it's just a really fun game, first of all, to see what comes out. But I think what will be unique and interesting is how each individual, if you and I sat down with the same newspaper, We'll be able to come up with something different. Yeah, I'm sure if all of our Moonshot members all sat down with the same couple of paragraphs, we'd all create something pretty unique and pretty interesting because we all have a different approach. And that's the key thing, I believe, that we learn from Steel Like an Artist. Yes. Just because Picasso was inspired by uh, eight other individuals before him does not mean that you and I, who are going to be inspired by Picasso, will create the same work. Yeah. We will create different work based on the inspiration that we get from them. That's right. And that, for me, is just so exciting. And I think a little bit there, it it's funny, like if, if you're asking yourself, well, where do I start with that? For whatever mm -hmm. reason, as you were talking, I just thought of Pinterest. Pinterest is so yeah. neat because you can collect mm -hmm. inspiration. Oh, yeah. I like that. So I have on my Pinterest, I have boards around the classics like food and, and fashion, but I also have illustrations, books, mm. all sorts of design and brand stuff. Like it's really mm. eclectic. I even have just color palettes that I like. Yeah. I have no idea why I'm collecting them, but I'm like, oh, I like that. <laughs> so I think that's like a really good place to start yeah. is thinking practically how might we collect inspiration. That's a great build. I've, I find sometimes I use uh, Instagram to a lesser extent, but now the bookmarking 
uh, capability is, is very, very handy. So if I ever find uh, mottos or a piece of inspiration, boom, I'll save them and I'll come back to them next time. I like the the build of having colorways and so on, you know, we, you and your design mind. I know that you've got architectural books surrounding you as we speak. Yeah. So you're probably looking at all these different, you know, physical pieces of design that are inspiring you. I'd love to see your Pinterest at some point. Yeah, yeah. But you're right. It can come, inspiration can come from anywhere. Yes. And the important uh, call out that I think we've got from that final book is to collect it. Yep. Collect it, collate it, store it in a way that you can revisit it, you can utilize in the future. Much like when you and I are making notes in any of our meetings or any of our moonshot shows, all of that is getting absorbed and it's only going to be for the better in the long run. Absolutely. Absolutely. Now, you mentioned inspiration a lot there from the collection. The bigger question right now on everybody's minds is which of those four clips are going into Mark's homework activity? Which one? Well, look, I think the I think we've really made the case, and I hope our, our listeners, viewers, and members agree. I think we've made the case that stealing like an artist is a behavior and a habit that can herald brand new ideas. I think for me, Mike, the idea of subtraction. So the the clip that we heard from Clark breaking down uh, a complicated idea or complicated uh, insight into something that is very very clear cut. And, and small and simple to communicate is going to be the key thing that I can work on and that I would like to work a little bit more diligently within. What are the areas for you today? I mean, all of these clips were pretty unique and, and interesting today, but what stands out to you, Mike? I, when I take a, a look at the list and think, like, I want to do more remixing, like Ooh. taking two old ideas, but that not from the same family, right? So take mm. something from business and architecture and combine or creativity and food, right? Or, you know, like the, the, like making different combinations. He, for some reason, he makes me want to be like a creative remixer of some sort. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, I absolutely know what you mean. But what a fun job that would be, the creative oh. remix. Oh, yes, yes. Well, Mark, you've been my creative remixing buddy today, so I want to say thank you to you. I want to say thank you to our listeners viewers and members for show 257 of the moonshots podcast where we studied the work of austin cleon steel like an artist and boy did we do some stealing today we learned that number one nothing comes from nowhere nothing is original everything comes iteratively from history and great creativity is not about just randomly collecting it's not about hoarding, it's about creativity is subtraction. The hardest thing is the simplicity, but that is where the great creativity comes from. And to do that, you need to sink into it. You need to go deep into it. And remember, don't hoard, collect, find the inspiration, and you will be able to unlock your creative ideas, which is such a great part of what we do here on the Moonshots podcast. That's a wrap.